Okay. Oh, we have one year round. We have a bit of 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 I'm living here on Dakinyang country on the central coast. Um, and I just want to give respect to country and to everyone that here um, in this meeting always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Jasley Davis. Um, I'm, my bloodlines go back to the Davises um, from Rollins Plains, but also have bloodline connections to the Wotherspoons from Platts Estate. Printons and Browns at Dingo Creek around the Manning area and the Thoughts and Snows um, from over the ranges at Moonbi. Um, I was born and raised on what am I country in, in Foster and have strong um, connection to my family and community there. I'm presenting today with Gwen Young Warren and G, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, before I do though, feel free to um, pop in the chat the countries that you're dialing in from. Um, just to give that acknowledgement for your country as well. Nata Goanyan Verapai Tangari Kalban, Badaba Purida Guba, Gimbai Makor Gula, Guri Guba, Gimbai Bilun, Birapai Guba, Gimbai Goyuan, Tangari Guba, Gimbai Gilligan, Gilligan, Badaba Gimbai Dawan, Goanyan. So my um, my name's Gawangan. I'm a proud Birupai and Dangari woman, and um, my bloodline totems are the Australian bass, or what is known as the Australian bass, and um, the koala, Gula. Um, my northern clan group um, totem of the Birupai nation is uh, Bilun, which is the stingray, and our nation totem is the grey nose shark, the Goyuan. Um, and on the Dangari side, that Dangari totem is Girgan, which is the um, praying mantis. And then my um, birth totem is Dawan, which is the Pied Butcher bird, and um, the Black Swan, Gorangan, which is my woman's totem. So my bloodlines are the Davis. Um, Davis is also from the Rollins Plains area, um, the Signs, the Morans, and the Donahues um, that link back into Dangari country as well. And I was born and bred on Bitter Pie Country in Port Macquarie. Vungbo. Marangbuti. Um, yeah, so can we go to the next slide? Um, Guanyang, that's okay. So Guanyang and I uh, were working together on Gatang language revitalization. Um, and that's the language of um, our people, the Bidapai, um, as well as what am I doing by people. So um, I guess to start with our qualifications to do this work is that we are Bidapai women and we are raised up and supported by our mothers and our aunties to do this work. And having said that, I just want to take a moment um, to give our respects to Kuwanyangu Ngaya Ani Ronda Radley and Baraba Ban Auntie Mandy Davis who've guided and trusted each of us um, on this journey and onto this sort of path of language revitalization. Um, additionally, Gulwan Young has a Master's of Indigenous Languages Education, and I'm currently a student studying my Master's of Applied Linguistics. Um, the Gatang language footprint I mentioned captures three different people groups, all very closely connected, built up by Watermai and Green Guy. Um, Gowen Young and I identify as Biripai, uh, which is pretty much Port Macquarie in the north down to Tari in the south. Um, our main river systems include the Wilson, Hastings and Manning rivers. And our neighbouring mobs are the Dangadi in the north, Gomori and Anawan out to the west, and um, the Watermai mobs to the south where I was born. Um, G is going to share a bit with you now about our... Um, how do Gawakura works and our governance structures? Yeah, deadly, thanks, Ed. Um, so our shared language, we believe, has been Wuvalin, um sleeping as a consequence of the cultural genocide uh, experienced by our peoples through colonisation. 
So it is our collective cultural and sovereign right to learn, speak, share, and teach our language. Duigal Wakada means to speak as one, and it seeks to empower our community through language. It's a Northern Bidapai language working group um, formed in 2020, or formalized rather in 2020 to grow the Gatang language through a number of uh, language revitalization strategies in the geographical areas of the Greater Port Macquarie, War Hope and Lauriton catchments. The working group consists of members of the Gatang language community uh, with connections to the Northern Bidapai region through language and who are passionate about um, revitalizing Gatang uh, with us. So there's an ongoing need um, in our area for leadership and resource development in the language revitalization space. And Duga Wakada really aims to be one of many um, spaces that foster and support um, supports this need in the Gatang revitalization work. So the group consists of Bidapai, Watamai and Gringai language activists, um, advocates, teachers um, and speakers interest in, interested in a strengths and solutions-based approach to progressing Gatang within the northern Bidapai region. And I can't sort of emphasise that enough that we very much um, communicate the importance of having that strength and solution-based approach to progressing, progressing Gatang. Um, so there are five key principles that underpin the work of Juiga Wakada, um, and they are cultural respect, uh, justice and equity, leadership and accountability, um, respectful engagement and having strong partnerships, and being culturally responsive as well to um, systems and services um, within that greater um, Northern Bidapai sort of region. So much of our business is around the receipt of language translation queries. And as you can imagine, they're um, very varied in terms of what we sort of receive on our inbox um, through Juriga Wakada. Um, and when we receive one, we come together often to unpack um, those requests. And Jazz is going to talk a little bit more about how we go about doing that um, and some of the challenges and sort of lessons learned. Um, so we get our translation sort of checked by Mordobai as well. So we work in really close partnership with a, a regional language centre, um, which is Mordobai Aboriginal Language Cooperative. And so once we receive that sort of query on our inbox, we'll get together, we'll sort of um, do that unpacking together. Um, we'll put some language to it and put that kind of forward and decide whether we're even going to respond to that request or not. Um, decisions are sort of made around that. And then we'll get that checked by, um, if it's public language use before it goes out in the community, we do get it checked by Mordebai. Um, And then we'll enter that into our word and phrase bank. So we have a bit of like a, a spreadsheet, I suppose, for all these requests. We put them in there. So if we do get this, a similar or same request next time, it actually saves us a lot of work. Um, and we're documenting as we're going as well around um, sort of what's, what's appropriate. So we're not constantly having to do that unpacking um, within the same context. Um, so the translation is provided with our Indigenous Cultural Intellectual Property Statement around it as well. So our ICIP is really, really strong and it is wrapped around what language we do provide and we'll share a little bit more about our ICIP as well. Um, it's worth mentioning too that we work closely with the Southern Bidabai um, Gatang Language Governance Group, the Jari Language Group. Um, so there are deadly brothers and sisters sort of down south handling um, translation requests so often we will get translation requests in for that geographical area because we're not necessarily as connected to that geographical um, area. The cultural context by which that language actually has to sit in um, when it pertains to that area is better coming from that language um, governance group down south, um, just to sort of honour it within that cultural context. So we work really, really closely um, with that southern language group, the Jari um, language group mob. And then um, we also have a regional language meetup um, that involves, you know, members of Gumbengir, Anawan, um, Bidapai, Wanamai, Goringai, Dangari. Um, and we get together and we kind of strategize and share how we're approaching our language revitalization activities as well. So we'll have, we've only had one of those meetings, but we have another one scheduled in um, a fortnight where we're all coming together again. And it's really a space where, and it's a really inspiring space where we can kind of share our hopes, our um, 
you know, some of the challenges that we're experiencing as well in that language revitalization space, how we can better support each other. So I'll chuck over to Jazz now, um, who will take you through some of that cultural unpacking that we do. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we did want to talk a bit about, um, I guess, our understanding of language and the way that we center better by perspectives in, um, in our language reclamation work um, is something that's really, really important to us. Um, there's some quotes on this slide, so uh, I'll just contextualize those. Last year, um, the Aboriginal Languages Trust published um, their inaugural strategic plan um, and a report from consultations that they conducted with Aboriginal language communities and practitioners across New South Wales. So Jill Gawakuda um, was one of the language practitioner groups that were consulted as a part of that process. Um, these publications are available on the ALT's website for anyone who wants to read more. Um, but both publications include some really um, beautiful quotes from people who participated in the consultations. Um, and the, the quotes that I sort of went through those documents and I pulled out um, the ones that are on this slide, I pulled the, these ones out because I think they all uh, speak to an understanding of language that really resonates with me. Um, and that understanding is the notion that um, we're in relationship with language and that this relationship we have with language is characterized by connectedness uh, to both country and kin. And um, it's a relationship that informs our ways of being and doing and knowing. Um, so this understanding of language is, 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 it is more than a tool for communicating. It's actually, um, to us, it's an entity almost of its own, uh, which country and ancestors can communicate with and through. Um, on the slide there, Uncle Warren Foster uh, from down the south coast at Wallaga Lake, um, he was quoted as saying, the land has heard our language spoken for thousands of years. When we speak language in the bush and call out the names of the animals and plants, they react to us. And my auntie Mandy Davis was quoted as well. Um, and she said, language is the missing piece. It is connection, identity, who I am as a Biribai woman. I can't fully have my connection to culture, country, kin and ancestors without language. Can you jump to the next slide for me, sis? Um, yeah, so this understanding of language that was articulated in those quotes and that I'm sort of trying to get across, um, I think it suggests that for mob, well, I know for myself and for Gowan Young, that um, true language reclamation has to involve more than revitalizing phonology, grammar, lexicon and syntax. Um, it actually requires a reclaiming of connection through our languages. Um, and I, I've got a quote there, I've been reading um, Native American linguist Wesley Leonard, and in some of his writing, he reminded me that, I guess the Western linguistic approach to indigenous languages was born out of colonialism. That's that's the period in which our languages began to be studied um, I, and they were studied as objects and uh, Indigenous ways of being and knowing weren't valued in, in those studies. Um, so instead our languages were explained through their structural properties rather than social or cultural practices. Um, so in my view, I guess, for example, um, yeah, we can build up the number of Gatung speakers, uh, but this isn't helpful. Uh, if language, it's not helpful to language reclamation, uh, true language reclamation, I mean, with that connectedness. If those new speakers of Gatung that we're building up, if they're only learning Western linguistic explanations of Gatung language archive, um, then it's not, it's not reclaiming our language in its fullness. Um, and I'm not trying to deny the importance of unpacking and learning the linguistic structures of Gatang for us. Um, that's definitely something that we do a lot of. Uh, but that work, um, that unpacking, it needs to be done through Birabai, Watermai and Gringai perspectives. 
through connection to country and kin so that we can reclaim language uh, in its fullness through those deeper connections. Um, and I really think like anything anything other than that kind of method would probably result in a, in a somewhat colonised version of our ancestral language. Um, and I love this quote from Leonard. He said, uh, radical Indigenism takes as a core assumption that Indigenous philosophies of knowledge are rational, they are articulable, and they're coherent logics for ordering and knowing the world. Radical Indigenism centres Indigenous perspectives and critiques the narrowness of what counts as evidence in Western science. Radical Indigenism calls for Indigenous concepts to guide the production and assessment of Indigenous language work. And that's, um, that's what we're trying to do. Can you jump to the next slide, please, G? Um, this is a picture of Durgan Mountain um, up near Loriton, which is part of an uh, important part of Gurupai country. So layers and layers of meaning. I mean, Gurupai ways of being, doing and understanding, those are all founded in our interrelatedness with all things. And they're expressed through ceremony, kinship, and then of course, through our language, through Gacham. So the framework for our worldview, it's um, to me, it's like our butchi and our dilly bag, which is held together, you know, by many, many weaves of gadal. Gadal is our word for grass. Um, each weave is connected to the other through strings of relatedness, um, through kinship and story. And butchin stays really strong that way um, through all that interconnectedness. Um, and the intricacies of our strings of relatedness, I think, are reflected in our language words. Uh, often words will have layered meaning um, that reflect the multiple strings woven around the word or the concept. And part of the reclamation of language and decolonizing is not just revitalizing the word, but revitalizing all those intricacies and moving beyond the colonial sort of translation or just the English translation. Jurga Wakada is exploring layered meaning in the way we approach our translation and reconstruction work. So um, I guess I've just picked out like four examples of that work to, to talk about today. Can you go to the next slide, please, G? Mm, Bara. I think um, we have all these recordings of language. So, so we've got a few audio, but for Gatang, most of the um, data comes from written written field notes and recordings. Um, so we have to do this work of reinterpreting non-Indigenous recordings and translations of our language. That's a big part of our reclamation work for Gatang. And the, just as one example from our dictionary, we had um, Bara and it was recorded by a number of linguists written down, but it was also recorded in conversation with Uncle Eddie Lobin, who was a bit of my elder from Perth Fleet, who we have a lot of audio recordings of. And I think I noticed that in Uncle Eddie's stories, when he uses the word, it usually translates to mean down. Um, but in, in the written recordings for Bara, um, it's, they've translated it as meaning east. Um, and that difference to me sort of highlighted the gap between a bit of my understanding and a Western linguistic understanding of Gatang. Um, I think obviously more research probably needs to be done on the use of the word bara. Um, but one thing that stood out to us is how uh, insufficient the word east is as a translation of this word. Uh, east is a magnetic direction on a compass. Uh, but for Birupai, we orientate ourselves through country and through story, not through the compass. Uh, so when we think of Bara, um, we might think about the river traveling down from the springs up in the mountains that stand between us and Gomorrah country. Or we might think of the river flowing down to the ocean on the outgoing tide. We might think of traveling to the ocean and all the ocean stories. Um, we might think about our three special mountains over near Crowdy Bay, near the ocean and the stories around them or the direction our ancestors traveled in different seasons. I mean, like we could probably go on. There's a lot, 
there's a lot of thoughts that Bara conjures for me. Um, so there's layers to our understanding of traveling Baragor and we want to work to make sure that we're learning those layers along with uh, the word itself. And in the photo, there is Saltwater Lagoon at Old Bar, um, which funnily enough has also been recorded as a, as a translation of Bar at place name. Um, engineering words. Um, G mentioned, you know, we've, we've got a lot of work to do in that sort of um, area of our reclamation of Gatung. Um, but where there is a gap in the recordings, it's a big part of our work to try and engineer something to fill that gap. Um, and obviously, in our view, it's essential that any language engineering is done from a bit of Bywater Mayan Green Guy perspective. Um, the example on this page is um, Marungara. So we don't have a word recorded in Gatung for respect. Um, marungara is a transitive verb that we've engineered to represent something similar to respect, but more from our cultural perspective as Bidupai people. So marung is recorded as an adverb that means well, um, and ngara is a transitive verb, which means to listen or to know something. So we, we engineered marungara, which becomes to listen or know something well. And I think marungara is a really important part of our kinship structure, actually, because it, it operates probably like the glue for that structure. Um, it's seen in the outworking of our kinship obligations and responsibilities to each other and to country. So to properly to perform our kinship obligations, we have to have marungara. We have to have deep knowing and understanding of our kin and what our responsibilities are in those relationships. Um, this requires deep listening as well. So uh, marungara is articulating something that isn't just, you know, an attitude that we slap on for a special occasion when we want to show respect to an important person or a dignitary or something like this. It's actually marungara is like a way of moving through our everyday uh, that acknowledges um, our interconnectedness and our interdependence. Um, with everyone and everything in, in Bidipai community and on country. Um, just on the next slide, it's, this is another example of um, word engineering. I wasn't involved in the engineering of this word. Um, it, it's an example of like what I think is a really culturally grounded language engineering. Nuraba, it was engineered by our language elders uh, in the very early stages of Gatang language reclamation work. Um, I think the story I was told is that at the time they needed a word for home, um, but it had to be distinguished from your home that is your house, like your ganya, to, and to mean your home country. So they're looking for this, a word for home country, and we didn't have something recorded for this. Um, so. They took ngura, which is the gatang noun meaning camp, and ba is our place tag, meaning um, place of or time of. So um, ngura ba um, is camp place or camp time. And I think there's similar constructions of this word um, in the data for Nyampa, Murawari, Iwalawari, languages. So in those languages, I think they've got like Nguramba is translated as birth country or family country. Um, so in Gatang, we've got Nguramba and it, it refers to our home country. Uh, but you've got to have that, again, the laid understanding because home country includes everything that is Bidipai. Uh, it's country itself. It's our sky world stories. It's kin, place, um, ancestors, creation being story, song, yesterday and tomorrow all at the same time. So Ngurapa is conceptually um, quite deep and layered. And um, yeah, I think is just a really good example of how we revitalize through cultural perspectives. We've got the photo there of Bill Bill Creek at Rollins Plains where um, G and I, um, a lot of our old people camped at that place. So that's part of our Ngurapa. 
And we'll just jump to the next one. Yeah, this was my last example. Um, cultural integrity and language use. So we have to consider in our language work the context that Gatang's being used in. Um, so we're thinking more and more about where and how are our language words being used and whether those uses actually align with better bicultural values. Um, this was an example uh, of we had, sorry, I should have given a cultural warning that there was this image of this, sorry, a baby shark fetus in a jar. Um, apologies to anyone who's been a bit shocked by that. Um, but it's an example where we had this language request come from a science department um, and they had sort of like a series of animal fetuses uh, which were being kept in specimen jars in their science room and they wanted gutung labels for each of the specimen jars. So we had this language request come through our normal sort of system um, and the group Druga Wakura we began just straight away giving offering up like translations of words for these different animals. Um, but then we started to yarn like a bit more deeply on it. And the more the discussion progressed, um, a lot of us started to sort of feel that we weren't comfortable with Gatang being used in this specific context. Um, and I relayed a story to G at the time because when I grew up, we actually had a grey nurse shark fetus in a jar in my home because my stepdad and my mum, they were divers, like dive instructors. And I don't know, I think my stepdad had collected it. Um, but for better by Goyuan, the grey nurse shark is our, our gimbai, our totem. Um, and the idea, like to me, of having such an important ancestor or really any of our animal kin kind of kept in jars instead of being returned to country, it just didn't quite align with some of our cultural values. Um, and in the end, with that request, um, in order, we felt like to maintain cultural integrity for Gatang, we declined the request um, in that instance. And, you know, I think it was like this ongoing conversation, it probably still is about, because you, when you decline something like that, you are losing a learning opportunity of getting language out in the community. Um, but at the same time, you had to ask uh, what, understanding of gatang are the kids learning when it's attached to a specimen jar and is that connection is that the connection or promoting the connection that we want them to have through gatang um yeah so this was just another example where i guess cultural perspectives sort of um heavily influenced the way we were translating and i think that goes to you g on some of our ICIP stuff with all of that cultural intellectual property wrapped around our language thanks Sophie. um well done so um the layered meaning <clears throat> and the cultural integrity of our language is why our um ICIP statement is so important it really speaks to you know what um sister jazz there is talking about um how do we make sure that the cultural integrity of the language that we're providing is maintained um, and going to be honoured in the cultural context by which it's being provided as well. Um, so that ICIP statement is so important in the agreements we enter into when we provide our language translations. So it gives us the power to protect and um, reclaim language in a way that maintains that cultural integrity, but it also enables us to continue sort of decolonising our understanding of, of our words as well. Um, so we've included some of the sections of that um, ICIP statement that particularly addresses this. Um, and our ICIP statement really sets the tone in how we want others to be working with us. Um, that and their approach to power, place and space within their projects as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that now. Um, sorry, I'll just stick to the next slide. Uh, so the way I'm going to sort of unpack this is um, have a little bit of a yarn. Um, so I was at this um, languages sort of gathering um, not that long ago and a non-Indigenous linguist who really sort of um, doesn't always value Indigenous people's voices was presenting there um, on the Indigenous language that they are working with. And there was no one from that language group there co-presenting with them, um, nor were they kind of endorsed to be there in the space. 
So it really made me wonder, um, you know, how long has this person sort of capitalised off having power in that space? Um, how much social academic capital had they been able to benefit from, um, among other non-Indigenous non linguists, so within their field, um, from the academy? And were they checking in on what was actually happening on the ground? Um, and how long was this actually happening for? So, yeah, it left a lot of questions. Um, unanswered for me walking away from that space and I guess when we ask these questions as Indigenous peoples um, it is often implied uh, that we should just be grateful that a linguist is interested in working with our endangered language um, that's often you know the vibe I suppose so establishing effective relationships and partnerships and being transparent um, and taking a power conscious and strengths-based approach really is key um, when working effectively with black fellows in language revitalization spaces. Um, and to be able to do this, um, it comes back to a reflection of power, place and space. So to help guide this reflection, I'll use our kin and aspects of country because they are physical reminders of these concepts on country every day. So the snake, um, the Mbachai often forgets its power, both real and perceived in both place and space. It reminds us of the importance of thinking on how we tread, where we position ourselves um, when we're working with others. So power in languages revitalization, if you think about it, who has it predominantly been held by? Um, so the question for many linguists working in Aboriginal language revitalization here should be what real or perceived power do I hold within this space? How do I reduce, share or transfer power when navigating this space to empower, empower others? Who else needs to be here that are not here? Whose voices do we need to hear the most in this? What does a psychologically sort of safe environment look like for all when we're working in those, you know, within multidisciplinary teams, um, delivering on projects in language revitalization? So black fellas really aren't free from a reflection of power, place and space either. Um, we have a responsibility through our ways of knowing, doing and being to reflect all the time on how we reduce power through collective based decision making, utilising flat structures of governance and really where equity and justice is centred in the work that we're doing. So I can tell you right now when I'm sitting in a circle with my aunties, I know my place um, when to speak who would need to be speaking first on any given topic, um, you know, who's doing that welcome or that acknowledgement that day. So I know I know what the kind of the knowledge hierarchy is sitting at the table and um, our place is very much determined by that knowledge acquisition and our social and kinship structures at the end of the day. So the shell reminds us to listen, to understand first and foremost, um, it also reminds us of building on ongoing um, learning and respect in a spiral way. And that circling back um, for good understanding is really, really important. So we ask ourselves, what is my place? Um, how do I contribute and how do I do this in a meaningful way? And sometimes as individuals, and um, this means sort of taking a step back and acknowledging when we aren't well placed to lead something, but rather better placed to serve and support. So how can I best circle back from my sense of place? Um, far too often people play a role in projects with MOB and they take that, they take our knowledge, they take our experiences without circling back on how these were used, how they were incorporated, and often the cultural context by which they were given in is lost. Um, so place is very much about accountability and it's really about responsibility as well. So for those that might be, you know, on our Zoom today that are um, non-Indigenous linguists, if you are working in Indigenous language revitalization spaces, it's worth asking yourself, what is your role? And does it come from a place of service or, or self-service? Um, and finally, space. Um, so last month, I was speaking to a non-Indigenous linguist um, who suggested that non-Indigenous linguists still need to lead in the space of language revitalization in Australia because First Nations people really lack the skills um, to be able to do that. So I was quick to respond that this was not the case. Um, and as a proud Yorupai and Bangari woman working in um, languages revitalization, I was trained in aspects of applied linguistics through my languages education degree. 
Um, so many universities are now empowering us to work in hands-on way with our languages in revitalization contexts. And therefore this idea that we don't have the necessary skills or expertise is now really being viewed by us um, as a reluctance to give up power to those that have never really had it um, historically. So who else than the oldest living researchers on the planet? Who else um, other than those that carry the memory of these languages literally within our veins, in our being, and who connect with our languages every day when navigating our, our cultural landscapes and when practising our cultures? So who else should be really um, taking the lead on our own languages but us at the end of the day? Um, so the kangaroo can only ever move forward, um, the one would. It reminds us um, to keep moving forward with intention and purpose um, and strength at every milestone. So strength doesn't always mean for us like, you know, powerfully, but it takes strength to move gently, carefully with purpose too. So how we hold and navigate space is paramount to success when working um, with us as black fellas and maintaining relationships is far more important um, than meeting outputs. In fact, outputs on any project um, are produced far quicker when it's when it's a safe space um, for those participating. So how are we setting the scene for the space? What is our collective and shared intentional vision of this space? How to contribute to creating a safe space? These are all great questions to be asking ourselves. Um, and this inevitably, inevitably comes down to place. Am I best placed to be speaking on this or doing this? Um, and how am I occupying this space? What language am I using in this space? Is it strength space? Is it forward focus? Um, whether virtual or physical spaces, what matters the most to us um, is that opening and the closing off of space as, as well. It's really important to think about that. Um, and how we set the scene, I suppose, and how we circle back and close the circle is really important. So we're going to close um, the circle now and close off our, our presentation. Um, and I'll read a quote. This is from um, Badavanaya, my mum, who's a Gatang elder in, in the Gatang language space. And she says, it's now time to heal and express ourselves through our culture and language. Our language is a form of communication that goes beyond the spoken word. We communicate in so many different ways, expressing ourselves through our art forms, dance, song, storytelling and music. Breaking the language silence, we can now merge ancestors, speak into our cultural practices and healing past and future generations. And um, for those that do know Rhonda Anjakuri um, Rad Radley, um, she's just completing her PhD at the moment on the use of much adjuyal, so hand talk um, when teaching the Gatang, Gatang language. Um, so we hope we set the scene for you on how we, as a language governance group, um, Judah Wakada, the speakers one, are practicing language governance, sharing and reclaiming our language proper way whilst navigating the ever-increasing, relentless Western gaze. Marumbu, thank you. We might open up for questions now. <laughs>